Hello and welcome to episode 46 of Off the Bandstand. My name is Christian Wiggs, I am your host. Today's episode is Ryan Hagler, a native Austinite and bassist who recently made his return to town to complete his DMA at the University of Texas at Austin. Ryan received both his bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of North Texas in Denton, where he was a part of the One O'Clock Lab Band, and then lived in Ecuador for eight years, where he joined the faculty serving as professor of bass and ensembles at the College of Music of La Universidad, San Francisco de Quito. In this episode, we talk about avoiding personal comparison on the jazz side of social media. We also talk about creating music honestly instead of trying to fit inside of a genre, and a confusing gig, or bluegrass gig, at an Ecuadorian beauty pageant in the Amazon. So moving on to the releases of the week, the first one that we have is my new single, which came out last week. It's called One Note Samba, and it's from a session that we did a while back with Damian Garcia, Ben Trish, Matthew Maldonado, Fabio Agustinus, and Marco Antonio Santos. A huge shout out to my engineer, Charlie Kramsky, and mastering engineer, Nick Landis, for their work on this track, and also to Michelle Ayubi for their incredible vision behind the camera and in the editing room, which ended up resulting in the cover photo or cover art of this single. It is a pleasure and just an honor to work with creatives all the time and to have people like you supporting these projects, whether it's Off the Bandstand, my recorded work of Between Love and Fascination and previous records, or this new single. I'm so grateful for you and uh, even one person listening uh, means the world to me. So thank you so much for supporting this release. If you would like to support it, you can go over to christianwigs.bandcamp.com and then Bandcamp is where you know all the musicians really get the most out of the support of their uh, you know projects that they release. And then if you want to know all the other things that are going on, you can go over to ChristianWigs.com. And then for all of my daily thoughts, opinions, recommendations, announcements, what have you, you can go over to my Instagram handle, which is at ChristianWigs. Now moving on to the second release of the week, this is Tatiana Mayfield's 2012 record, A Portrait of Lady May. And I ashamedly had not heard this record until I was talking to Ryan about some of the things that he's recorded on over the years. And uh, I'm just ashamed that it took me this long to check it out. But rest assured, it has been on repeat for the entire week. You should go and support that this week and every week after. The tracks and uh, the composition, the arrangements are all killing. And Tatiana's voice, tone, style, you name it, it fires on all cylinders. So if you want to support this release directly, you can go over to TatianaMayfield.com and then her Instagram handle is at Lady May Jazz. So moving on to the uh, Monk shows of the week, the first one is the Glenda Davenport Quintet, which is going to be tomorrow, Friday, June 4th. The next one is going to be on Sunday. It's going to be the Ephraim Owens Quintet, June the 6th, and that is going to be at Shay Z, live from Shay Z, which is where Austin Jazz Society had all of their concerts monthly before the pandemic, and then they found their temporary home in Monk's as we were still navigating the shutdown and trying to figure out what was the best, safest way to bring music to uh, uh, native Austinites, and then now through live streaming, people all around the world, wherever they might be, they can go and check that out and tune in. So that one will be live streamed from Shay Z. Uh, the next one we want to plug is going to be on Tuesday, June the 8th. It's Mitch Watkins Quartet. This is going to be one of the final installments of Austin Jazz Society's Project Safety Net fundraiser series, or concert fundraiser series, and that's going to be at Monks. You can get uh, tickets for a live in studio audience there. And then finally next Thursday, June 10th, is Jeremy Langthorne's Quintet. So that is all of the Monk shows that we want to plug this week and all of the releases of the week. Go check out Tatiana Mayfield's album from 2012 and my new single from last week, and then all of the Monk shows that Colin Shook has been curating. He is doing just an incredible job of being the glue that is holding the jazz scene in Austin together over this past year and will continue to do so moving forward. So anyways, that is everything for this week. Let's dive right into this episode. Here's episode 46, Ryan Hagler. This is Off the Bandstand. <laughs>
like, what do you do? Like when you're not, uh, having DMA responsibilities and stuff like that, what do you do to unwind? Uh, I play a lot of video games. Okay. Tell me about <laughs> it. What do you play? Uh, lately, uh, doom eternal Xbox. Um, I, you know, I, I tend to stick with one game for a long time. I don't, I don't need like a lot, you know, I, yeah. I'm not, the, I'm not the kind of guy that, that tends to spend, you know, 12 hours a day or something. Yeah. Um, it's, it's more like, you know, 20, 30 minutes and kind of reset and, uh, and I'm good. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm curious, do you find that video games feels like a waste of time when you're like, Oh, I should be shedding. Or do you feel like it's like, no, this is the balance that I need. I mean, it, it can definitely go there, right? It can yeah. definitely detract from that. But I mean, I, I love it, man. I mean, it, I, I find it weird that there's like, we've decided as a culture that there are like categories of activities that are worthy of being something you do in your free time. Like yeah. if I was, I don't know, if I was like, gardening or um i don't know building something i, I mean i guess that's different because you're making something but i think yeah. you, you get my point you know there's like categories of hobbies that it's like okay that's that's worthy and you're not missing out on things you should be doing but video games no you're wasting your time and i've always thought yeah. that's really weird it's like it's just fun you know yeah um so yeah that, that's the way i feel about it you are, yeah, this is, this is the safest space. You were talking to the exact right person on that. Cause, <laughs> cause it's like, man, uh, you know, I think Kurzman and I were talking about this the very last episode, cause he was the last guest, mm -hmm. um, just about how like that, it really doesn't matter what you're doing as long as it's not like hurting you or other people, like yeah. whatever brings you that balance, whatever brings you that peace is like the thing that you should be doing. And I think that, um, I think especially like the last generation of people and then our generation and then the younger generation is really starting to break down a lot of those like barriers of like normal or like normally acceptable behavior across many different mediums where it's just like no do like don't harm other people but do what is best for you right. um uh just like in the same way that people who work night shifts uh feel like maybe and i can't speak for all people who work night shifts but like sure. in the same way i mean we work night shifts so i can i can speak from my own experience that, that's true like when we wake up in the morning and then we have nothing to do all day other than, you know, obviously like practice and try to like book gigs and, and do other things yeah. because we're not working a conventional job. It feels like we are wasting time. And then we get to our job and sure. we're like, oh, okay, yeah, this is what we're supposed to be doing. But because of the fact that we're working on kind of the inverse of what, you know, I don't even want to say normal people. I almost said normal people do. Um, and even that Careful. can be damaging, right? Um, not right. to say that we are normal as jazz musicians. It's not, that's not always the case. But anyways, now no. I'm rambling on, but thank you for, for, for saying that. Cause that, uh, that definitely like hits home where I'm like, oh, that's the piece that I needed to go play Call of Duty after this. There you go. I mean, at least for me, and you know, I, I talk to my students about this too. I, I really do think that there's, for the vast majority of people, there's a limit to like, especially in terms of practice, like there's a mm. limit to productive time. I think mm. for most people, there are freaks of nature that can just sit down and bang out four hours, Yeah, you know, and it's productive for them. I am not built like that. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I have to kind of rinse yeah, right. <laughs> the brain, you know? So I, I really like to do practicing in these like little short focused bursts mm -hmm. where I'll like, you know, warm up for 20 or 30 minutes and then I'll go just do something else. I'll go wash the dishes or, you know, play yeah. video games for 15 minutes and then kind of like, okay, cool. And then I'll come back and hit it for another 30 or 40 minutes. And then, yeah. Or even less, sometimes less, sometimes 20, you know, and then go do something else and go check my email or go even just screw around. And it doesn't yeah. have to be anything in particular, but I find that I'm personally much more productive when I bounce back and forth like that. And plus it kind of re removes this pressure of like, how much did you, did you do? You know, yeah, that's right. not, that's not a healthy way to think about what we do. Yeah. I don't think. I think another thing too, is that, um, and, and I, I don't want to be that guy that goes social media because then it becomes like a whole other thing. But I do think, again, I'll, I'll just speak from personal experience. Mm -hmm. When I finish 
shedding or like, like those micro bursts, right. Of, of different things. Yeah. And then I try to go play video games or like, you know, I'm somebody who the reason why I play video games a lot, especially call of duty is it's something that I can kind of zone out on. So I love to right. listen to records while I'm playing video games. Cause I'm not focused. That's interesting on the video game. It's just a means of like keeping my brain going on like a holding pattern of something that it already knows how to mm. do. So that mm. way it can satisfy like the, um, the caffeinated side that needs to be doing something. So that way I can let the calm side of my brain focus mm. on something else, which then results in me finishing or like quitting a game in the middle of a game, but not because I'm rage quitting just because I'm running over to the piano. Cause I just had an idea or something like that. Um, like that literally happened today. Uh, we'll talk about this later. This literally happened today um, with watching the 7 p.m. set of the electric quintet and i heard oh. Na naima and then i just went to the piano and then i started texting damien and i was like hey man what are what are some cool like substitutions for like this chord what should i be doing on this like it, different stuff you know because mm -hmm. i really love talking to damien because damien's just like okay yeah great and then he's like an encyclopedia of all these different things that you can do yeah great guy but Anyways, back to the original point, you can already tell that this is a series of tangents, uh, but back to the original <laughs> point, um, the, I'll like go and like play video games. I'll be trying to rest, but then I'll get on Instagram. And of course, like our feed on Instagram is just a bunch of other jazz musicians, especially the New York cats. And they're showing, you know, like, and I love this person to death. Like I would never say anything negative, but like Stephen Feifke is like looking at the camera and just playing like the most ridiculous thing. And I'm like, oh shit, well now I'm wasting time because I can't do that. Even though it's not even my mm. instrument or my, my focus mm. at all. And then I feel sad and convicted that then it either contributes to me going back to the piano and hitting maybe diminishing returns or it, results in me being sad and playing video games like being like Ugh, like i'm not at that level like how do you get to that level so it's kind of this toxic you know merry-go-round so to speak and i do think there's a way to get out of it um and maybe you do too uh i'll stop talking <laughs> and i'll let you talk about it i mean social media is really weird and i, I don't i don't know that i have fully formed opinions about mm -hmm all of it, you know, I mean, I, I do think about it a lot. Um, but I, more than anything, I just think it's, it's, it's just uncharted territory as far mm. as humanity is concerned. It's like, right. I, I, I think everybody thinks they know what's really going on. And I don't think anybody really knows what's actually going on. Um, just in terms of psychology, more than anything else about what that experience is doing to our brains. Like for me, it's really strange just what you described, which is I think super common, not just in music, you know, I mean, it happens to people with, with their, with their looks or with their mm -hmm. athletic ability or with anything that anybody does because yeah. at your fingertips is the best humans in whatever thing you want to think of. And you can just look at them doing that and they're yeah. great at it and they're better than you. And it's very funny to me that, that for some reason, the default mode of our brain is to feel bad about that instead of feeling inspired about it. Mm. Like, yeah. why, why does our mind do that? Yeah. Why is it that you see that video of Stephen Feifke and you just go, God, I suck. Yeah. Instead of, wow, he's amazing. I wonder if I could do that. Yeah. Like, why, why is that? I, I don't know. I don't know the mm. answer to that question, but I find that fact fascinating mm. especially it's pretty universal i mean you got to be pretty psychologically healthy <laughs> sure. you know like you you got to be like a like a what what am i trying to say like a, like a monk yeah yeah or you know it's like I, I was trying to think of like an athletic analogy like a you got to be like a, a mental bodybuilder yeah you know to be able to just react like Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And then that's it, you know? So I, I feel like we need to be a little more aware of that fact, mm. you know, just, just more cognizant, you know, and try to, and try to just not go to that space because it should be inspiring. Yeah. You know, yeah. like every time you see a Jacob Collier video, instead of just being like, God, I'm so mad. I'm not that good. Mm -hmm. You should just be like, wow, that's incredible. That's so cool that there's a human that can do that. And then yeah. just move on, you know? 
Um, that anyway, that's my thought about it. No, man, that's, that's exactly the right thing. Maybe the people who, uh, do meal prepping for the week, have it figured out. Like that seems like a lot of structure. Like maybe they have the discipline that we need. Let's get them on here. Our next guest. No. Um, anyways. Yeah. I mean, it's just it, that whole sentiment of, um, don't compare yourself, you know, always like try to find inspiration in things and don't oversaturate yourself with the stuff that intimidates you. Um, and don't oversaturate your mind with those feelings of being intimidated, but try to take, right. try to take that, that sentiment of like, Oh, I can do this because they couldn't do that at one point. And chances are, if I put in the same discipline as them, but then that kind of brings us back around to the original point of what's that balance of that discipline. At what point does it become, diminishing returns and what point does it become unhealthy and toxic, uh, to try to, you know, have discipline above all else. Yeah, man. I was just, I don't know if this is, if this is tangential at all, but, um, I guess it's related, but I, I remember having a conversation with a, a buddy of mine in school. Um, he was, a, he was a grad student, so he was, pr he's probably, I mean, 10, 15 years older than me or something. I think he was in his mid thirties and I was probably 21 or something. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I was just trying to figure out music. Maybe we're going to talk about all this stuff later. I don't know what you have on, on the docket, but, um, I was feeling bad cause I, I kept playing these standards gigs and I didn't know enough tunes, mm. you know, and, and I was telling him about that. And, you know, some people had made me feel kind of bad. Mm. It kind of vibed me pretty hard. And I was, I was pretty hurt and I was trying mm. to deal with that cause I was a kid trying to, you know, figure this out. Sure. And, uh, and he looked at me and because he knew my history, which again, this is probably what we're going into, you know, but I grew up listening to heavy metal and especially Metallica. I was like obsessed with Metallica as a, as, as a kid. And uh, uh, he asked me, he looked at me and he was like, how many Metallica tunes do you know? And I was like, I don't know, probably like 50. Yeah. And he was like, okay, do they know those tunes? And I said, probably not. He said, don't ever let anybody let you feel bad for not knowing enough music. You know, mm. a lot of music. Yeah. You know, and, and the, so the reason I bring this up is because there's this thing of like, everybody's different, man. Mm. You know, everybody has their set of things that they can do that they know um, that they like, and it's all different. Yeah. And, and, but for some reason we go around and this is a, this is one of the things of social media is, is it feels like there's all these forces pushing you in, in a particular direction mm. and you feel inadequate if you don't fit whatever that is that it's presenting to you. Yeah. And so I feel very, very fortunate to have been given that lesson pretty early on because it really landed. It was like, oh yeah, of course I'm, yeah. I'm who I am and I've got this. And it's okay. If I want that, then I can get it. But if I don't, that's fine too. Yeah. You know? Right. Um, so that, that was a pretty heavy lesson. Um, and of course that was way before that was probably in the early days of Facebook when Facebook was, well, I guess it's still kind of stupid, but it was really stupid back then. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Man, that, that is beautiful to me too. The, um, I have even struggled myself with being like, okay, um, I really love bebop. I would love to be classified as a bebop vocalist. Like, I think that is very fun, but there comes a point where I think everybody, whether or not they want to admit it, any one faction of jazz, even though bebop is, you know, kind of the, I mean, there was obviously 50 years before that, 40 years before right. that. Uh, but it's kind of become the bedrock of like modern, modern jazz. Uh, oh, sure. uh, I would, I would, you know, hopefully nobody you know comes in the comments and goes, well, you're not being, you know, but um, the jazz police is coming for you, man. Look right. out. Exactly, man. Jazz canceled. Uh, but no, like it, it's kind of become this bedrock. Um, and at the same time, I mean, anyone in town knows that, that knows me well, knows that, uh, you know, Kurt Elling is, is, kind of where my interests really, really hit home. And so, right. uh, you know, and, and 
sure, he does bebop stuff too, but he's also trying to do stuff that is more than that and and, and add in like a, or not even more than that, just a, a branch on the tree that is our, our art form. Um, mm-hmm. And so like you were saying, you know, there's a bunch of people who say, well, like, oh, you know, you don't know all these tunes, but it's like, everyone's different. Everyone has their own bag. And I feel like sometimes, especially young musicians, because I felt this, uh, there's this mounting pressure where it's like, okay, you have to first become a master of bebop and then you can go do whatever it is that you want to do. You have to learn all this stuff and you need to be proficient to a T in this one thing. And the people at the top are like doing that or not even the people at the top, just like the people that we see, you know, they're doing a lot of bebop. So then it's like, why? Yes, we need to know the history and we need to like appreciate and we need to be able to be mindful of that and have that then, you know, be absorbed into the sounds that we want to create in our own projects rather than trying to create something out of a vacuum. Um, mm-hmm. But even that make something out of a vacuum if you want, you know, like have the freedom to do what you want to do. Uh, but I, I do think that that's very freeing where it's like you don't have to learn all this stuff and then have your interest come later. Um there's a balance. Sure. I will. I would qualify that a little Please. bit because, because there's, there is this other consideration of course, which is uh, we got to work. Right? right. Exactly. So, yeah. so, you know, and this, it, this took me a little, it took me a few years to, and I, I mean, sure it does for everybody, but it definitely took me a few years to kind of navigate and understand and, and realize that, yeah, okay, we are artists. That word is always a little, it's loaded, right? Sure. <laughs> but we are artists. What we're doing is art, sure. But someone has to pay your rent. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and you got to be able to go buy food and put gas in your car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. that means you have to, by definition, that means you have to do something that someone else wants to pay for. Yeah. Which is a very uncomfortable thing for a lot of musicians. Yeah. That is just that really when that when that lesson really lands, it hurts. Yeah. You know, for for most people I think, you know. And so it, you know, trying to figure out a way where you can do what feels artistically validating and interesting to you. Mm and make money. That's of course the sweet spot, but we all have to do things that we're uncomfortable with, you know? Yeah. And, um, but you know, for me, I, I mean, not that this makes me uncomfortable, but at some point it was just like, okay, I have to learn a bunch of tunes mm-hmm. because if I'm, you know, I like playing jazz. I enjoy this. There are gigs, you know, and I look at, you know, go to gigs and see other people playing and okay, these are the tunes they're playing. I got to know those tunes. Yeah. I got to know those tunes because if I don't, I can't get those gigs and I can't make the money. That's yeah. it. Right. You know, now money, money is only part of the equation, right? Part of it is I want to play those gigs, right? It's not just about, about money. Um, of course, but you know, so there's, there's a, there's an artistic piece, which you described very, very well. And then there's this kind of functional practical yeah. piece. Um, and finding a balance between those things is, it's tricky, but it's something yeah. you got to think about. And, and you got to think about it like that, I think. I mean, maybe there's another way to, to formulate it. But, you know, at the end of the day, you got to do something that somebody else wants to pay for. Just like any other job in the world. Yeah. You know? 100%. That's actually something that I, I had written down, um, you know, and it's funny. We've already kind of hit some of these things, but I wrote down. Yeah on have you made a record because I texted you that, but uh, like I had a little segment, I like to make just like very minimal notes. I don't like to be scripted, but what I wrote down was, you know, I had just watched Bo Burnham's Inside, which I had talked about already uh, and Mm -hmm. had a long conversation with Lydia afterwards about creating albums or in his case specials and trying to satisfy slash be honest with yourself as a creative but also not uh, creating too narrow of a niche that you alienate what could otherwise be a robust audience. And I think a lot of us come up in at least pop music thinking that the more people like your stuff, the better. But even something that Zach Kurzman said is, if one person listens to my record, that is enough and is meaningful to him. So have you thought about making a record? And if so, what are the, the considerations, if any, that you toil over when balancing accessibility with artistic integrity? Ooh, that's a lot. It that's is a, a lot. lot. Well, you know... Just me, my musical path and, and journey, I've, I've always found writing to be very, very difficult. Mm. 
Um, and, and it's not something that I've, uh, that I've spent really any significant amount of time working on. Mm. Um, you know, I've always, even from, you know, really, really young, my first real musical thing that was mine was a band with this guy. I went to, it was middle school. We were, mm. I think he was, he was in eighth grade. I was in seventh grade. Okay. Um, and you know, and he was writing songs already. This kid was like, I was, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And this kid was already like cranking out tunes and had his lyrics all printed out and everything, you know, was this heavy metal stuff? I mean, it was rock, Sure. you know? Yeah. It was just, yeah, it was rock. I mean, I I don't know if I class later, we, we, we got a little heavier, you know, and that band continued all the way. I was still in college when we were still, we were still doing stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure any of it was all that good, but you know, (laughs) uh content is content yeah man but uh you know i guess from that very early stage he was kind of bringing in material that was fairly you know here's a song and i've got lyrics and there's a melody and there's a you know not really chord progressions they're just riffs you know but but i i fell really quickly into this this role of like collaborator of like, Oh, that's mm-hmm. cool. But maybe that needs to go over here or, mm-hmm. or man, it needs to be like another section that, that connects these two or, or, you know, then solo would be really cool there whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I've always enjoyed that role mm-hmm. a lot. And, and, you know, I guess I'm not sure why, but I just never, never put the time in to do the, to do the writing thing and, and, and my own thing, you know? Um, so yeah, there's, there was a lot in your question though. So that, that's kind of the reason the, I guess the primary reason why that's never happened, you know? Sure. Um, and I, you know, the, I guess the other side of it is I really love to improvise and I love, uh, there's just songs, so many great songs out there already yeah. uh, on one hand, you know? Yeah. And it's just like, man, I just want to play all those, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, and I, I, I guess I just haven't ever had that, that really strong drive that a lot of people have of like, I really want to have my thing. Sure. It, it's just, that's not really been a, a, a priority of mine. Yeah. You know, I, I would like that, you know, and it's something I'm thinking about more these days. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as how, how did you phrase that in your question about artistic considerations? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I said, what, uh, what are the considerations that you toil over when balancing accessibility with artistic integrity? Mm. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's really, really well worded. Cause that's, that's the conflict, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's this is something I, I, that particular thing just in general is something I've thought about a lot. Um, because I think especially in the jazz world, we get really narrow mm. in what we're thinking about. Um, and, and accessibility is almost like a four letter word, mm. you know, like, Oh, well, if, if regular people <laughs> like it, then yeah. it must not be good jazz. Uh... There's almost, there's almost that. I mean, nobody comes out and says that. Oh, right. But, yeah. They use code words, right? They say like, oh, it's kind of lame or, you know, yeah. or, or, or they use the word pop in a particular way that kind of, uh. kind of <laughs> jabs, you know, and, you know, God, that sucks. Yeah. Like, and I, full disclosure, I was totally one of those people mm. until not that long ago. Mm. You know, I'm not sure when that transition really happened. Um, probably within the last decade, you know? Um, but you know, there's this push to, for music to be like really intellectual and, you know, like it's almost like, I feel like a lot of jazz people, they want to be able to describe the music in words yeah, with like, and have that be really impactful more than they want to write music. That's really great make mm. music that's really great i should say right they want to be able to say oh you know somebody says well what what's the deal with your record and they go well you know it's and they describe it with all these it's this plus that and then we do a little of this you know and yeah. and and they they seem more interested in those words 
than in the sounds. Mm, yeah. I, I think, I think, you know, um, you know, I encountered this a lot in my job in Ecuador with my students because there was a lot of, you know, young people, 19, 20, and they would say things like, you know, oh, I really want to mix jazz with indie rock. Mm. And I go, why? Why? Did you write a song that sounds like that? Yeah, right. Or did you come up with those words and you're trying to make sounds that sound like those words? Ooh. And that, because to me, that's not honest. That's not yeah. honest music. Yeah. And I guess to answer your question, to come circle back to the question, I think honesty to me is just so important. Mm. It, it, and, and honesty in music from where I'm standing right now in 2021, this could change, is, is that you heard a sound in your head and you figured out how to play it. Mm. And if you're not doing that, you know, well, okay, it, it can go the other way, which is you're playing or singing or doing whatever and something kind of comes out and you explore it, right? Yeah. But that to me is coming by music honestly. Mm. Whereas if, if, if words are involved, descriptions, language, then, and I don't mean that in terms of lyrics, I mean, describing sound, right? Right. If, if, if words are, are that prominent and present in, in your process, man, is that really music that mm. you're doing? Mm. I, I don't know. I, it just seems really weird to me. Um, you know, especially nowadays, it, Maybe this has diminished a little bit with streaming, but you know, certainly in the days of like radio and MTV, I think there was this obsession with genre, you know, um, and like, well, what genre is that? And you know, I mean, I grew up as a metalhead. Metalheads are maybe the worst at this. Okay. okay. You know, I don't know if you know about that. Have you, have you ever been a metal guy at all? I've, I've never been. Yeah. Okay. Can't assume. There are uh, just uh, innumerable varieties. If you dig into it, you know, there's, there's death metal and there's black metal and there's speed metal and there's, you know, Got and it. it just go, and there's math core and hardcore and death core and grind core. And just, it's just, yeah. what does all this mean? It doesn't mean anything, right? It's just, oh, this band sounds a little bit different than this other one. I guess we need a name for what they're doing. Wow. Yeah. You know, and it's like, yeah. that's dumb. That's just straight up dumb sorry you know what that reminds me of is like okay so so there's there's a sound that i really really love and i could never put a, a name on it i would just hear it and i'd go boom that's it that's the shit that i want to make hmm. and then i would later come out come come to find out that that what they were talking about was ecm records mm. but ecm was not a genre ecm again if i'm wrong then i'll edit this out so i don't uh, criminalize myself <laughs> It was a label that right. had a bunch of people experimenting with new sounds. Right. That then after the fact became a genre by calling it like ECM, like era or whatever, you know, the exact phrasing was, but it was like these people making certain sounds. And then they were like, well, what do we call this? Right. It's right. jazz, but I guess it was all happening on this label. So let's just attribute, you know, those three letters to this genre. And I feel like that to me is honesty, right? Where it's like, we're not sure. even like trying to put like a thing on this. We're just making the things that we like to hear. Uh, it's a very experimental time too, I guess. But um, yeah, anyways, back to you. No, that's a, that's a great thing. That's a great point. And uh, that's, that's a great example, you know, but ECM is a very particular case because, you know, as, as far as I know, the vast majority of those records were produced by one person. I'm blanking on his name. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so there's, you know, they were recorded in a very, you know, in a particular way. There's a particular sound on the record, mm -hmm. you know, which if you're playing acoustic music, um, the tone of things, the sound of the room, the sound mm -hmm. of the microphones, the sound in your headphones, that all influences the way you play. So, yeah. you know, uh, being in this studio versus that studio with this microphone versus that microphone, that changes the, the content of the music as well as the sound. It's not like yeah. I play the same way in every room all over the world. No, it's not yeah. true because it's right. acoustic, you know? Yeah. 
Um, so it, it, that's, it's an interesting case for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, Oh, it's like an ECM groove, you know, what is that? But yeah, right. yeah, but most of those musicians also, you know, were a lot of them were European, you know, so there's a different aesthetic there. Um, but honestly, to, to, to expand that out, I, I, I feel maybe not exactly the same way, but similarly, uh, the way I do about all that metal stuff I just talked about to a lot of the different varieties of, or supposed varieties of jazz. Mm. Um, this is maybe a bit of a, a soapbox, but you know, it just, it just annoys me that, that we, ha we have so many designations for, you know, I mean, the one I'm thinking of in particular is cool jazz mm. as this kind of distinct stylistic thing. Yeah. I guess, you know, <laughs> it's soft bebop. <laughs> you yeah, know, right. <laughs> it's like soft bebop and we have to have a whole new name for it. Yeah. Really? You know? Yeah. Um, it's weird, you know, yeah. um, you know, hard bop, soul jazz. Okay. Which one is yeah. it? You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, Art Blakey's moaning, you know, is that. Is that soul jazz or is it hard bop? Mm. I don't know. Does it matter? Yeah. But, but we tend to structure so many conversations about, about jazz around these kind of, you know, mm. uh, these kind of ideas. And I just think it's weird, you know, especially since jazz happened, especially that period, you know, the four, mid forties to like the, to like 1970, things moved yeah. quickly. <laughs> yeah, We're right. only really talking about, you know, a handful of records or a handful of years in each of these supposed categories. So it's just very yeah. strange to me. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And mm, I won't go too far into this because this could border on, um, mm, I'm debating whether or not I even want to say it. This could border on <laughs> heretical. Um, uh -oh. but, but like what you're saying, right? Like a handful of records over a very small amount of time, jazz from the tens, right. To the fifties was completely morphed into something completely different. And then that to Joe Zawinul and Chakra Pistorius right. within 10 years, completely different. Um, here's a, here's a, here's an even more crazy way to think about that. That's one lifetime, right? That's one human being. Yeah. Like there were people that were born when the first jazz recordings were made in the 19 teens who were yeah. still alive when headhunters came out. Yeah. You right. know, that's crazy. Yeah. And <laughs> that's and really crazy. My, my thought is that I was like, okay, this is bordering on, on heretical is like, um, sometimes we just lock into like what we think is classic, right. Going back to the sure. idea of bebop. And this is kind of what I was maybe alluding to subconsciously or otherwise earlier, which was like, do, do your own thing. Like, yes, take all that stuff with you. Take the stuff, learn the stuff that, that books you the gigs, but like, let's keep developing the lexicon, you know, um, mm. uh, and keep that going. Anyways, I'll jump off that because I fully realize that I am 25 years old. I do not know shit. And these are all just very like little opinions, but. I, well, no, I, I, I mean, yeah, if you want to change, if you want to move on to something else, that's totally cool. But, but, um, I don't think you're wrong there. Um, and there's, there's this constant struggle, right? Between, between reverence to tradition. Mm. And I think this is true in almost any kind of music. Um, there's reverence to tradition and we're trying to balance that with like pushing the envelope and doing something, doing something new. Um, and you know, I've definitely heard, like, uh, I was just talking about this with, uh, who are we talking about? I was talking with Matt Muling uh, mm. a couple days ago. There's this, uh, I don't know if it's a video or, or a print interview with Pat Metheny. And he says, you know, when he was coming up, uh, it was, there was this really huge focus about doing something brand new. Mm. You know, what's, what's your thing? Mm. That was the thing. And if you sounded, you know, just like Wes Montgomery, well, what the hell is wrong with you? Mm. You know, um, that to me is a little too far on the other side. You know, maybe there's the uh, the traditionalist 
neoclassical, they like to call it in the jazz history class. Sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's that approach on one hand. And then there's this other approach of like, if you're, if you sound like anybody else, you're bad. The truth has to be as always somewhere in the middle, somewhere right? In the middle. Yeah. Um, and you know, the way I frame this, uh, again, especially talking to students and for myself, um, is that, man, you really can't play like anybody else except yourself. Hmm. The only person that you will ever sound like is yourself. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason for that is because, um, we're all a collection of experiences for on one hand and tastes. You know, like I, I have friends that I have, we have very similar musical tastes, but it's not identical, mm. you know? And even if we like all the same things, the amount that we like those different mm. things is a little bit different. It's yeah. like the mix is just a little, a little different. And so when I practice the music that I'm hearing, um, that I'm trying to get out of my instrument is just not going to be the same. Mm. It just, it's impossible for it to be the same. Mm. Right. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a weird thing, you know, students sometimes ask, you know, me or, you know, you hear it in, uh, you know, clinics and master classes. they say, how do you develop your own voice? And I was go, <laughs> what a ridiculous thing to think about. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, just like, don't, don't think about that. Just think about what you like Yeah. and do that right. all the time. Right. And just be guided by what you like. And if you play something, you hear yourself recorded or whatever, and you don't like it, well, don't do that anymore. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, it's not simple, but it isn't complicated. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I don't think. Well, I think it's anyway. like, I think because of the fact that it's not simple, we try to make it overtly complicated. Right. Um, and we think it's this like, and I say that as somebody who like, like I, I right now and God, I need to stop talking about it. Cause like in, in the past several episodes, I've been like, I'm working on like four records that are all going into this like big work. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bo Burnham even says something about like, you know, I've heard him talk in podcasts in the past where he's like, you know, these people post like just finished chapter two of my book on Twitter. He's like, Hey, just disappear. And right. Then come back and be like, here's the thing. Um, right. But I, I will say maybe selfishly it, it 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 does help to to like talk through those things as 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 i'm oh yeah writing something but um basically you know this is going to be if i think about it as one work it's like my fourth record but if i think about it as like the four individual records that it's, that it's going to be it'll be like four five six and seven um and i just now feel like this is arriving at something where like there's one two like most of the things like you talked about being a collaborator david mescatique has been my collaborator for the past mm. five six years whatever it's been and we've made two records together and then we're about to make these together um but i feel like finally there is i've written melodies i've also been able to like tell him what kind of uh, uh, sights or, or, or feelings or emotions or different things that I wanted. So that way he could, you know, write changes. And then we could like, uh, 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 kind of workshop those into exactly what I was feeling because he just had that vocabulary of, of sounds that, that I just didn't mm -hmm. have as a vocalist yet before I really mm -hmm. started playing piano. And now on this one that I'm working on, I like literally just two weeks ago, I was like, Oh my gosh, here's, I think from start to finish the first tune that I've actually, written and feel good about um and that was like it took me 25 so eight years of mm. me trying to figure out who am i who what is my voice supposed to be like who am i as a musician yada 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 and then it it took like even a pandemic to just go you know what Fuck it. like <laughs> i'm just gonna uh i'm just gonna sit at the piano and write what feels like healing to me or like if I'm having like a chaotic day, I'm just going to play a lot of very, very, very stacked chords that do not sound appealing to maybe anybody at all. And then I go, Oh, I resonate with that. That feels like controlled chaos to me. Mm. Maybe that can result in something. 
as long as I balance it with accessibility, bringing that back around, like, you know, full circle of, of something where it's like maybe other people, I, you know, I was talking the thing that you were saying about honesty to circle around to mm -hmm. that and then I'll be quiet for a second is, is that <laughs> I literally was just telling a student this week, like I, I listened to the Olivia Rodrigo new pop record called sour. And, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of my students like to sing that stuff and I, I just let them do what they want. And I try to teach them good technique and stuff like that and style sure. through whatever they, they, you know, find resonates with them. Um, so I was like, all right, it's my duty to like listen to that. And, and I really don't, listen to a lot of pop music but i started listening to it and i was like you know what pop music is actually kind of good right now that can be an opinion that a lot of people would be like actually no it's dog shit but again all subjective i was like pop music's kind of good right now and the other thing that i felt about listening to it is like there's some lyrics that i don't really care for in here that seem like a little just like kind of on the nose but she is honest and i listened to like billy eilish and i was like their voice sounds honest. It doesn't feel like yeah. they are trying to be a character of somebody else. This really feels like somebody who is maybe not sure of themselves as a human being necessarily, because we're all still figuring it out, but she feels confident in where she is at this point. And I told my student, I was like, look, people maybe have musical tastes that they like more than others, but as long as you're honest, I don't think that somebody can sit in a room and watch a concert live, have somebody who is truly being authentic and walk away going, that sucked. You know, they can go, well, at least they were really, mm. at least they really cared about telling me the way that they felt and, 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 and were, were being honest with me and not just trying to be a caricature of whatever they, they liked. Um, there are things that I watch and I just go, mm. I, I didn't really care for that, but I know that this is something that it was like burdened on them to make. And for that reason, I appreciate the effort that they put into it. And I feel like if we took the genres away from things and just looked at things from like an honest standpoint of sharing art that was honest, things might be a little bit more accessible. Again, I'm going down a very large rabbit hole. So I'll, yeah, it looks like you, you had something to say, so I'll, I'll, I'll well, I'm kind of processing everything you're saying. Uh, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot there. Um, I mean, I, and I, I've, I've been struggling for many years, you know, I mean, I, I was a full-time teacher for eight and a half years. So I thought a lot about how to, how to help people be better, you know? And, and there is another piece there. I think, I think mm. this is, I'm, I'm conjecturing here. I'm going to like put this in a big, uh, in parentheses, because okay. I don't, I don't, I don't know if this is if this is true. I'm kind of thinking out loud, but I feel like there has to be some piece that's just being. I guess the only way I know how to say it is just being good hmm. at music generally, right? Because hmm. on the one hand, there's there's the idea of what you're hmm. doing and the content, right? Hmm. And that's the honesty that you're talking about. And we're trying to get as close to that as possible. But then you need some level of musical ability on whatever it is that you're doing to be able to get that out effectively, mm -hmm. right? And that doesn't mean you have to be a virtuoso. I mean, the list of people that have been wildly successful and loved that aren't virtuosos in one regard or another is immense, right? <laughs> um, you know, I think about somebody like Bob Dylan, you know, who's like not, he's not a good singer mm. in any traditional Intensive. sense, yeah. but, but of course he's a great singer, you know, and his musical ability, he has, he uh, developed it in service of this honest thing that he was trying to do, you know, mm. um, so there's that, you know, because it, it doesn't matter how honest you are. This is, I'm going to be a little bit aggressive with what I'm about to say, but Please. it doesn't matter how honest you are if you're bad. Mm. You know, I mean, yeah. I don't, I, again, that sounds really awful, mm. um, but there's kind of not a, another way to say it. Sure. You know, um, it, I mean... <laughs> I, this goes, this is from North Texas. Uh, there was one class where I heard the heaviest thing I ever heard a teacher say to anybody, um, which was probably, this was probably a little much. 
Okay. But the sentiment was, was, was no, actually I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say that again. This was definitely too much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It was definitely too much, but something went wrong in this class as this person was playing and he stopped and gave very pointed feedback. And then at the end of it, he said, you know, nobody's going to hire you for a gig if you suck. Right. Whoa. And you know, dang, that is hurtful. You know, that is like, that is said in such a way that, that, that is painful to another person, but he's right. Yeah. You can't do this if you're not good at it. Right. 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 (laughs) So I I, I hope I'm making my point clear that there's this honesty component, but there's also, you know, you got to develop what you do to a degree in that, that degree could be huge. If you want to write, you know, insane music that's technically complicated and really difficult, well, you've got to develop your technique to that level. If yeah. you want to write songs like Bob Dylan, well, it's less, but it's not zero. Yeah. Right, <laughs> you right. know, it's, there's something there, right? Well, maybe that's, so, maybe yeah. that's the balance of left and right brain, right? Like technical side and then like creative integrity right and 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 i think that is the the, well it's like the difference of me seven years ago only being being able to play root position triads with absolutely no rhythm in either hand and it was just plunk 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 right and then the difference of being able to like you know really fill out stuff so that way i'm not reliant on a bass player and a guitar player to also fill out the space as i just hit and hold the sustain pedal down, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and as I like learned all that stuff, it wasn't the most expressive rewarding stuff. It was a lot of just like practicing scales and arpeggios and inversions and stuff like that in ways that nobody would want to listen to, Of course not. you know, definitely not my neighbor and definitely not my partner, you know, here, Lydia, like in the apartment, but like, but it took that for a long while. And then once I developed a competency, if we want to call it that to whatever extent, you know, that it was like functional. I'll say that it was functional. Then I could start to like, think about creative stuff and then let that kind of influence or guide because then like, you can't just have it all be technical because if it's all technical, then it's lacking emotion or feeling. And then nobody wants to listen to the most technical player in the world. If it doesn't have phrasing, you know, which sure. then also has to do with that honesty and that like, putting yourself into it. Um, boy, I'm going down a rabbit hole. This is like, no, no, this is all good, man. It's all good. Uh, I mean, I, 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 one of the most effective things for my own thinking and educationally speaking for me has been trying to come up with analogies outside of music to, because I don't think that the different, that, that, you know, music is, is special in that regard. I, I, I think that that developing a musical developing musical skills is really pretty much the same as developing any other kind of skills. Right. Um, but but for some reason, musicians we like to think that we're special and what we do is special mm-hmm. and it's magical and so it has to be different than all that stuff, you know. But I mean, I think like an athlete. Right. Um, I mean, like when you know, I love I love basketball. Um, you know, when you watch, you know, LeBron James or Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or somebody like this play, it's magical. It's insane. The, the, the complexity and the, the, the athleticism and the thinking and it's nuts. All the, the elements that are happening. But when they're practicing, when they were practicing and developing all those things, it wasn't like that. You know, they had to lift weights and, you know uh, run, (laughs) you know, just, just run, not play a game, just run, you know? And we have to do that too. And so, you know, a, a, a kind of concise way to say that is, is, uh, there's not, even if the end result is magical, all this, that doesn't mean that all the steps along the way are also magical. You know, it, it, mm. but a lot of, a lot of younger musicians, at least a lot of my students, they kind of have this, they wouldn't say it out loud, but they kind of have this feeling, you know, and it's the reason why there's all this resistance to playing things like scales and arpeggios. It's like, well, I don't want to yeah. do that. That doesn't feel like music to me. Well, 
Mm. If you want to be LeBron James, you got to get out on the track and you got to do some squats, you know, like (laughs) that's even if your goal is to win the NBA championship, like you still got to do all those other things that on their face, they don't seem to have a direct relationship. Right. Um, I think that's really important to really yeah. understand, you know, and a lot of young people just don't, don't get it. I, I feel very fortunate that I was so obsessive about music when I was younger, that it all was fun to me. You know, it's like, yeah. I would all sit here and play scales for four hours. I don't care. This is great. Yeah. This is great. You know, yeah. like, I, man, I, I learned all, all 12 of my major scales in, 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 yeah. you know, whatever tempo and 16th notes today. And I can, I can do that now. And I was, I felt yeah. very good about that. And I, it didn't matter to me that, that, you know, I'm not playing an actual song. I didn't care. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Proficiency is cool, man. Uh, yeah. Well, and in, in kind of a very beautiful, I don't know if you've intentionally planned this, but Uh-oh. in a very beautiful way, that kind of wraps around to the very first thing we were talking about, about mm. like, we look at Jake McCauley, or we look at Stephen Feifke, we look at Alex Tarantino, we look at Benny Benet, whoever, you know, insert person here, mm-hmm. and we go, oh, shit, like, how did they get there? There's no way that I can do that, mm. right? And we don't realize that, like, that's the magical end result. But all of the shit, the same insecurities, and I can't assume that all of these people have insecurities, but I think it's more likely than not that most people have insecurities. Oh, uh, yeah. As a given. Uh, so maybe we can't assume. But like, like with specific people, you know, just like we didn't see all of this stuff with Stephen Feifke on Instagram before whenever maybe he's like practicing something and then, you know, maybe slams the piano and then walks away and rage eats a whole bag of Cheetos like I do or whatever. You know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, rage eat. I like that. Yeah. Right. Uh, rage a, eat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a dangerous combination when you put that with uh, uh, video games and you rage quit and then you rage eat. It's just, you know, <laughs> it's a, it's a slippery slope, Ryan. Don't go down there. Just don't rage drink. That's bad. Exactly. Yes. That That's is the, bad. that is the, uh, the, the uh, PSA of, of this whole episode is like <laughs> rage eat, a bunch of carrot sticks or cheetos or whatever you want to do both of them are orange i don't know why maybe it's just like a subconscious whatever i don't you can rage drink high c orange punch there we go but not there you go not the other orange beer wow this is just awful <laughs> i am not a stand-up comedian uh i have very specific very curated jokes on the mic at gigs not here this is all unfiltered baby you're doing great man you're doing great but <laughs> listen i got I, two two lessons i got from friends of mine that mm. you just you just uh alluded to or reminded me of one you know talking about you know stephen Feifke slamming the piano or whatever uh and you know this is not a unique thought but it was when my friend tony spyro drummer a drummer turned uh, web developer actually is a very successful Whoa. web developer now um yeah very Whoa. very very cool guy one of my best friends from school um we actually had a we had a band together with uh, with matt muling like <clears throat> way too many oh, years cool. ago uh, enough enough years <laughs> ago that thinking about it makes me feel old but uh I heard you say that on the electric yeah. quintet thing. You were like, we met in 2004, which makes me feel bad about myself. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I don't remember what, how this came up or whatever, but you know, I, I don't even know how he was this wise at 19 or 20 years old or whatever it was. And he, but he just looked at me and he was like, dude, if you sound good when you're practicing, you're not practicing. Mm. And it was like, Oh, I mean, I felt personally attacked <laughs> i was yeah, like yeah yeah whoa yeah. okay yeah that's heavy um so that's that's one thing the other one uh talking about you know the development and everything uh there's a great uh trumpet player and keyboard player who plays in snarky puppy uh justin stanton um who i went to school with as well at north texas and you know we, we played a little bit uh we had a fusion band together for a little while with uh, with brian donahoe actually oh, cool. um yeah and uh, yeah, I forget who we were talking about. Uh, we were talking about some musician, I think somebody in Dallas, don't remember who it was, but he said something that just blew my mind, which was, man, I wish I could just listen to everything he ever listened to. 
-hmm. right? Rather than, oh, I wish I could do what he does. It was Mm -hmm. this recognition of what, what we were talking about a while ago about this, you know, you are what you like, what you've consumed, what you've experienced. He made that in this very visceral, direct way, which was like, that guy sounds the way he does because he listened to all these records. Wow. And it was just like, if you want that, you got to listen to all those things that he listened to. It's not about doing something. It's about consuming the art that led to that. And it was one of those moments where I just go, oh, whoa. You know, you, you just you just stare into space for hours thinking about that. Yeah. Because everybody is like that. Yeah. Every good musician you've ever encountered is that one way or yeah. another. I think I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Just, yeah. Just an amalgamation of uh, influences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a uh, that's a uh, an album title. Copywriting it right here. Nobody <laughs> um, take it. What was it? Amalgamation, amalgamation of influences. Good. I like yeah. it. I like it. Yeah. Uh, man, Ryan, I, there, I would say 90% of the things that I wrote down, we didn't get to, uh, but that is like so great. And that's the point of of the show, right? It's like, there were things that I was okay. Things that I might want to talk about, but I also just like to something very, we started with talking about video games and that's how it led, led to here. And that's my favorite thing is just genuine conversation. And it puts me on such a, um, such a high for for the whole week for the whole month having conversations like this it makes me so happy um i do have a couple more things i want to ask you before the end uh and also just as like a a quick thing one of the things that i did write down was checking out the electric quintet stuff uh from the first 30 seconds i was kicking myself that i was not there (laughs) the night of uh because it was so evident how everyone in the band was it was not like a band of, uh, of musicians like playing together. It felt like each person was an integral limb in a, in a big body of people making music where you all knew how, but it was in complete servitude to the music. So it was like each one of you were a limb and the music was the body and you guys were just trying to be in complete service to that. And it felt so non performative oh, wow. it felt like you weren't trying to satisfy anybody like kind of what we've talked about it didn't feel like you were trying to play what anybody would want to hear you were just playing the things and approaching the music in a way where not like okay now we need to you know be heavier because of the fact that people might be yawning right. or being bored so we should we should give them something that, that'll give them the same caffeine it was like and i i say this about Kurt Elling all the time is that like when he starts a show, he is the captain of this ship and everyone knows it immediately if they've never even heard him before. And they just go, okay, I'm going to focus entirely on you now because you have made me feel comfortable. And I have zero uh, uh, indication that you um, don't know what you're Mm -hmm. doing. So I'm going to just totally trust the evening with you as the captain of the ship. And it felt like that watching do you guys play? I was watching the 7 p.m. Mm-hmm. set and and the weather was very story tornado it was rough. outside, but it was just it was just sublime. Oh man, thank I you was, so I much. Was totally in a trance. Thank you so much. Man. Oh my god. Wow. That's uh those are yeah. very kind words, man. Thank you. I don't know what else to oh, say well, other than other than thank you. I mean, the, the 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 irony there is that is that I mean, obviously I've played a lot with with Matt. Uh I've played just one gig with with Daniel on the drums. Um, I've played a fair amount over the last year, you know, with, with Andre, uh, uh, John, John Dees, uh, yeah. we met, uh, I mean, I've heard him play, but mm-hmm. we had never met until, uh, he, we, traffic was pretty bad. So he was running late to sound check. So I think, I think he rolled in at about six fifteen, six twenty, Um, and we ran a couple, I mean, I'd given everybody tunes, you know, and sent some mm-hmm. charts, um, you know, talked about a couple things, but we kind of ran heads and that was, you know, I shook his hand and said, Hey man, nice to meet you. And, uh, helped him bring his keyboard in. And then, you know, 40 minutes later we did that. So, you know, it's just, it's about picking the right people, you know? And, yeah. and, and especially if you have, you know, I had a particular musical kind of vision 
I mean, I don't know how particular it really was, but you know, I had a vibe that I wanted. I wanted to be able to be flexible in certain ways. I wanted to play certain kinds of songs. Um, and I wanted people that could do that, that I knew would mm. do all the things that you're talking about, you yeah. know? So I didn't have to tell them to do that, you know? Um, which is what's to me is the most beautiful thing, you know, yeah. uh, there is in music, you know, I'm going to go, uh, <laughs> that, that, oh, man. beautiful, man. I mean, just like, and, and, and it was that, it was just like, right at the start, you and Jonathan D is just, I was like, Oh, this already feels good. Like, like just, just the approach, the, the, yeah. it, it was the light touch too. It was just like, here's just a little thing, you know, like whatever, you know, Jonathan had played and then just the communication and even your communication with the drummer, there were things where you guys were doing like these like kind of impromptu hits and you just kind of mm -hmm. like looked at them and you were like, bah, bah, and like kind of yeah. you know, like came up off your seat a little bit. And it was just, Oh man. Like if we can all have that same communication in our romantic relationships, we're all going to get married. Immediately. <laughs> like Jesus Christ. That was like a masterclass in, uh, forget couples therapy just shoot them that youtube link and it's gonna it's gonna fix some relationships real fast oh um, that's good man that's yeah, good beautiful that's well let me ask you the the two speed round questions the first sure. one is and especially this one is relevant because uh we always end with the second to last question is um if there's a record that you could suggest or in this case maybe two or three that you are just and it can be across any genre that you think this is this is what I've consumed. And if you want to know mm. more about me and my playing or, or even things just like, maybe this is not particular to my playing, but I think this is very important. You should go check this out. What are some Ooh. that you would suggest? Ooh, that's hard, man. You put me on the spot. Thinking could about be records. whatever you've listened to this week. Could be this month, this year, all time, whatever. Yeah. Dang. I'm Cause... just going to go with what I, uh, what comes to mind, you know, uh, one record that pops in my mind, and this is probably going to surprise everybody. Uh, but, um, there's a, uh, a live Bela Fleck and the Fleck tones record. Yeah. Uh, cool. It's called, it's called, I think it's called live at the quick. There's a DVD. Um, okay. and it's like all these, it's all these guest musicians, all these weird musicians from all over the world that do strange things, but it's a lot of what you're talking about, uh, what, the way you were just describing the gig, you know, this, this very organic thing and everybody has a personality, but nobody's really dominating. And, and, you know, I, I heard that record when I was in high school and I was just obsessed. Um, oh, man. Yeah. Uh, it, that's a good one. Keep, hold on one second. Hold on. Yeah. 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 What do you have it sitting right there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, there's no way I picked this record yeah. up in high school, man. Uh, yeah. there is no way that's crazy. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I got into that cause I was, I was really into, uh, like bass virtuoso. So I was, I, of course, yeah. like every bass player who's 15, I was obsessed with, with Victor Wooten. Um, but, but that record, you know, he's not really doing all that much of the flashy thing. He's really, being a bass player on a lot of those tunes um, that comes to mind. Um, I mean, this is really well known, but, but a record that's really important to me is, is that first RH factor record, mm. um, especially thinking about the electric stuff the other day. I mean, that uh, hard groove is the name of that record. Um, you know, it's got guest musicians, uh, you know, Q-Tip and D'Angelo are on there. And mm. I think Eric Badu is on a track. Um, that's killing. It's yeah. beautiful. Um, that's all that's kind of popping into mind right now. Yeah, um, I sweat, man. You know, I, I don't know. It, 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 my influence has been really weird. I've had a very bizarre, <laughs> strange and bizarre yeah. musical journey in a lot of ways. Sure. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what's on my brain right now. I don't know. Yeah. No, man, that's, that's great. That's fantastic. Um, well, and the last question, which uh, you might know is coming because I asked you about a holiday uh, segment type of this, but... Um, we all have gigs from hell. Uh, they do not have to oh. be holiday gigs. Uh, can you think of an exceptional gig from hell where things just went up the wall? Where it's like, what, what the hell is happening right now? Oh man, I might have to think for a second. Please take your time. Um, particularly bad gig from hell. Um, I mean, 
what I've had, I think that this is coming to mind is, is really weird gigs. Okay. Please. Because, uh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, I spent all those years, uh, in Ecuador. Mm-hmm. Um, and the very, at the very beginning, I met this guy, uh, who's actually from Austin. His name is Michael Shea, who was living there okay. and he's a musician as well, okay. uh, but we'd never met. Um, and he just happened right when I got there in 2012, uh, to be putting together a bluegrass band okay. to go on tour for the U S embassy in Ecuador. Okay. And we ended up doing two tours with a quintet. And the idea was like, it was like a goodwill tour, you know, to like basically, basically to make the United States look really good. That's really what was going on. And so they just took us to all these like rural, crazy places. And one of them, we played a beauty pageant in a town called Coca okay. uh, that is in the jungle. It is in the Amazon rainforest, straight up. And we played like, we were like the incidental entertainment in the middle of the, they call it, the, the beauty pageant in, in, in Spanish is, is the Eleccion de la Reina, which is the election of the queen, is how okay. they say it. Uh, and we played right in the, we played bluegrass in the Amazon in the middle of an Ecuadorian beauty pageant. Ooh, okay. Uh, yeah. And they were just as confused as we were. Um, <laughs> and the, the part that, that is insane that probably could have gone that could be the gig from hell, but wasn't is that they didn't tell us that they had pyrotechnics on the stage. Oh man. So there's a picture. I'll, if, you, if you're interested, I'll have to dig it up on Facebook and, and send it to you, but there's a picture of the banjo player taking a solo and he's just taking a solo. And then all of a sudden there's these like, like sparks just a few feet in front of his face. <laughs> and he kind of <laughs> jumped back and you know, it was just terrifying. But the best part about that gig by far was just, there were like 3000 just hopelessly confused Ecuadorians. Oh. They just had no, no idea <laughs> what was going on. Sure. I mean, we had, we had cowboy hats on and the whole thing and everything's in English. And it's just like somebody from the U S embassy came out and just said, Hey, we've got this band. They're called Texas express and they're going to play for you guys. <laughs> so anyway Ooh. that's that's just one of you know 15 really weird gigs that yeah. we did that year um that was the weirdest one but they were all pretty strange yeah jeez, man <laughs> how fantastic man i love that so much oh, yeah man. so okay this is this is probably i guess it's probably 2009 i was uh I think I was just finish finishing my master's. Okay. Um, but I was young, man. I was, I was still, I was barely 24. Not that, you know, in year 25, That's okay. um, but, uh, you know, I needed, I needed work and, and, uh, uh the, this band, you know, I was, I guess starting to get into the cover band thing, mm. uh, you know, kind of dragged in kicking and screaming, but anyway, uh, so this band, a couple of my friends were involved in kind of getting this thing going and it was supposed to be just disco, only disco. Okay. And the band, the band was called So Chic after that, that song, you know, yeah. that uh, Le Freak, Le, So Chic, Le Freak. Oh, Le freak right. out. yes, 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 freak yes, out. yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. But, okay. It was one of the, the idea was to be like a smaller cover band. Okay. So instead of having like 10 people, it was just three singers guitar, bass, and drums, and everything else was tracks. Okay. All right. Which in hindsight, is, if you're thinking about doing that, don't ever do that. <laughs> don't. Yeah. It's sure. a terrible idea. Um, but then we had like costumes. So we had like, like these bell bottom pants and platform shoes, which I never wore. Like he gave them to, and then I just didn't put them on. Yeah. Right. Um, and these like ridiculous shirts. And, and this is the kicker afro wigs even though we were all white okay all right which is very problematic yeah all right um okay but there was one gig it was a uh, it was a restaurant gig at this place in dallas called uh sambuca okay which is uptown uptown dallas fancy dallas and uh you know but then like and it, first of all we had two subs on the gig the guitar player 
and the drummer both oh, subbed out. No. And the male, it was two female singers and one male singer. And the male singer had just quit. And the, one of the female singers was like, oh, uh, my brother sings really good. Okay. And got her brother on the gig. Okay. All right. And then <laughs> like 48 hours before the gig, you know, um, the, uh, because the band leader didn't play. He was like a sound engineer who ran the band. Okay. He wasn't a musician. He was not in the band. All he right. just ran things. Uh, he, 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 uh, emailed us and was like, Hey guys, they want, uh, they want dinner music. So they want like a dinner set and then like a party set. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, we did not have any dinner music. And of course the obvious thing to do is just have the band like play a jazz set. Right. Right. And like no, no preparation needed. Just show up and play some standards. Fine. Right. But, <laughs> In his head, it would be easier if there were tracks. <laughs> so he sent a set list, like 15 tunes, no charts, just tracks oh. of like Sinatra and, you know, Ella arrangements. Yeah. Like the class, you know. I assume the stock, like Nelson Riddle. and Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. it's the arrangements that everybody knows, but Hey man, they're not that easy necessarily, you know, yeah. you know, uh, come fly with me and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Anyway, point is this kid, this guy had never played a gig in his life ever. <laughs> wait, 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 the, the male singer, the singer, the singer, oh. he never played a gig in his life. Like he was just a guy who his sister said, Oh yeah, he sings great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Of course, we're not in the costumes for the set. We're like, we're like just in normal, you know, nice clothes. And then yeah, we were going to, yeah, ch- yeah. and then we changed for the party set, you know, and everything is tracked. We're on in-ears. There's a count off. It's like, there's no flexibility. Sure. At all. Whatsoever. And I think, I think what tune was it? Uh, I think it was, I, I've got you under my skin. Mm-hmm. You know, most of it was somehow fine. Okay. I don't know how, but I think on that one, this kid just ate it. <laughs> just total catastrophe and and you know we've all done that right mm, sure but not with tracks oh no because there's nothing you can do right you right, can't right. extend a second this is not ableton live this is oh. it, this is this is press play do the tune down and you're right. done and this kid what did he do like bro <laughs> he like i think he forgot the words if i'm remembering correctly okay. but you know he's like trying to sing and there's you know, you know i've got you under my skin and then he gets it i've um, and he's like and he just like can't get it out and then this is the best part he just turned around to us and was just like what do, what do i do what do i do <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm like gripping my desk right now. I need something I to squeeze. I know. And you know, we're in this like fancy restaurant and there are people just staring. Oh, so, so it's not even like a, like a wallpaper gig where no one knows what's going on. Like, no, we're right they, in the middle. It's like a stage in the middle. I mean, it's like, there's, there's no escape, man. I mean, <laughs> we are right in everybody's face and man, I have never been so embarrassed in my whole oh, life. My you know, I mean, I feel, I feel worse for him, of course. Oh, sure. um, but holy shit, man. Uh, <laughs> I will never forget the look of terror on that kid's face as how, he turned how around. How old was this kid? I don't know, early twenties. I don't okay. know. Yeah. I guess. I mean, he's probably, he was probably 20, 21. Um, but again, it's not his fault. He's not a musician. Like, yeah. You know, it was his yeah. first gig. Oh, it was his no. first gig. And it was like the worst possible first gig oh, my ever. God. So that was the last time I played with that band. I think I, I can't remember. I, either the band collapsed right there or I quit. I can't remember. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, man. I mean, and we were just faking it. We we faked that whole gig. Yeah, I was about to say, how the rest of it go? Like, we, we, I mean, what, what did the audience do? What was the, because you can't. I assume you can't really come back from something that's just like a full stop train wreck 
I guess not a full stop though, because it's tracks, but it's tracks. I mean, we finished the tune. I, I you know, honestly, man, it's been it's been twelve years or something. Yeah, I can't sure, remember sure. exactly what happened. I just remember that <laughs> moment because it's just so visceral of yeah, just like yeah, he yeah. turned his back on the audience and turned back around and looked at the band. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that, that's my gig from hell. That is a nightmare. That is yeah. a the straight up nightmare. Like as you were telling me all of the components of this gig leading up to this, you know, dumpster fire. Um, <laughs> I, I was just like envisioning like the scene from Hocus Pocus where they're making the brew and the cauldron and they're like throwing all the stuff in here. And yeah, I'm just yeah, like, yeah, this yeah. is just like throwing every possible terrible thing that could possibly happen like into this thing and then just giving the singer the the big wooden spoon and being like stir it up baby stir it up because here's stir like it up. open wide jesus wow well thank you for a very confusing very comical gig and something that will <laughs> consume my dreams and nightmares for the next couple no, nights <laughs> get it you gotta push that out man Right, gotta go. You're good. You're good. It'll never happen. Yeah, amazing. (laughs) Oh, right. Well, thank you, man. That was that was absolutely worth everybody's time. Thank you. (laughs) Awesome, man. Take it easy. Peace. Bye. Later.